And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple, developer of your world, and coming to us straight from Joshua's workshop, the one and only, well, his name is on the box, Joshua, how are you doing today, man? Uh, I'm doing great, Mildra, how are you? I'm do I'm doing good, I, I'm already miss I'm already missing the winter, but I just have to wait a few months. I am patient. I am patient on that, because when the winter comes, it means I get free ammo. <laughs> nice. I, I'm not. I'm not such a big fan of, of winter. Uh, it's just something about like the snow and ice, and I don't know, it, it's a little too much for me. But the fall, that's that's where I. That, oh, that's you like favorite. the Goldilocks seasons? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the nice sort of in betweens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but with. The with that said, one of the early tr one of the traditions around here with every newcomer is the humble hmm. beginnings, the origin story, as it were. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> with that said, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Got it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th ooh, that, that's 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 a good question. So my first introduction, as I think it has been for a lot of people, was the show Community. Um, they had a D and D, well, two D and D episodes, and this was, I don't know, maybe like two thousand like twelve or so. I saw this. Um, the player or the characters were playing D and D, and I knew it wasn't like exactly how the games played in real life, but I saw them just being super animated and do like a story, being characters, looked like a lot of fun. Like I would like to try that one day. I didn't actually get to play for like years because I couldn't find any like group to play with. Uh, but then one of my friends was like, hey, I want to start like a small D&D &D group, uh, maybe around like back in 2017-ish. And uh, so uh, she DM'd the game for us. I played a bard in a D&D &D 5e, and uh, it was like the best experience ever. I'm a musical person in general, so I was just singing wacky songs, and, and she was just like, you know, encouraging all my creativity. I got super hooked. And from there, just like a whole deep dive into like D&D. &D, I played a tiny, tiny bit of Pathfinder and some Monster of the Week as well. Uh, but yeah, from there, you know, I started DMing my own games and just doing different one shots and stuff like that. Even did some professional DMing as well. Uh, and yeah, the rest is kind of history. I guess currently I'm in a two games where I'm not DMing, which is nice. Uh, typically, I'm the forever DM, so it's so nice to be able to be in like, games that I just play. But yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of my history and how I got into it, the show Community. Do you remember when it came to that bard? Do you remember which college you ended up picking? I was a lore bard. Yeah, yeah. This was, I think, before there was too many subclasses, and I don't know. I just felt like I just liked what, what they had going on. Um, I didn't really like know a lot, so it's just like, all right, like there's like valor or lore. I'll go with lore, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it, it, it was super cool. Mm -hmm. So. That brings us to your world, and and from what I saw with it, there's definitely a fair amount of five E's five E's DNA. But what prompted you to want to to want to make your own game? Was it a case where you were house ruling and it and it just evolved into that, or was or was there a different path? I would say it was a different path. I definitely house ruled a lot, but I think it's just I'm generally a. a creative soul i just like creating things and i went to school for game design more specifically like the path of video games but um i don't know i think i always i always had that sort of spirit and um even before the ogl i was kind of thinking about doing it just like uh, huh, that'd be kind of cool to do but i didn't really take it too seriously in fact i started maybe like a year before or so um i even released any videos about it i like started working on it and then i stopped because you know, it's just you get in your own head, like, ah, oh, who am I to, you know, design a game, right? Oh, uh, you know, by myself. Um, but then, like, after the OGL, yeah, I've been just like working and doing other things. I'm like, you know, what? Let, let me just 
let me just try it. Like, even if it's not, you know, successful or whatever, it would be cool to just make a, a product of my own, something that captures what I want out of a tabletop game. So it, it certainly wasn't uh, in response like the OGL or anything. I think I just enjoy making things. I like games. I, I love games, really. Uh, so it just kind of came naturally to me. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I could I could see that. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that a lot of the um, games that I've that I've been seeing people make in the last year are in response to the OGL, but it certainly was a catalyst. And I had, For sure. I had said in the past, in and this may this may sound a bit fucked up, but I think in a weird way the OGL fiasco was actually a net positive for yeah. the TTRPG community as a whole. Mm -hmm. because it got because it was getting people out of that stupor and in the oh, yeah. year since I've seen stuff like the homebrew network making mythcraft which they're doing their they um, yeah. are wrapping up their first full on full on setting expansion for oh, obviously wow. there's the whole tales of the valiant thing with kobold which um, yep. uh, which I'm going to be covering in more detail soon there <laughs> There's been stuff like DC20, which is doing very well for itself lately. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and new num and numerous uh, numerous other stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. the like I'm I'm not the only th the only thing I've I've had to tell people is for the love of God, stop calling these projects D and D killers. That it that <laughs> is the kiss of death. Yeah, yeah. Don't do it to yourself. <laughs> like how how many how many how how did all those World of Warcraft killers turn out, turn out to turn out back in the two thousands? Yeah, yeah. No, just focus on making your great game and make it as great as possible. Oh, and I don't. Maybe it will kill it, but don't don't speak it out into ex existence. You're gonna jinx it. And personally, I don't think anything's gonna kill D and D per se. But yeah, yeah. D d don't 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 put that on your game. <laughs> no, but um, it does make me laugh seeing D and D merch at Ollie's. <laughs> Which, if you're if you're not familiar, um, Ollie's is kind is kind of the big is kind of the big discount chain. So if your stuff okay. is in Ollie's, it is that it it is a a universal sign of the big box stores can't sell this. So we're so we're putting it over here and putting it on clearance where it's going to shelf warm so much that I need that I need to wear silver gloves in order to in order to pick it up <laughs> so I don't get contact burns or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I see D and D stuff everywhere nowadays. Yeah, I do. I do, and um, I have a I have a feeling that th that you're gonna that we're gonna be seeing a bigger variety of things. Um, mm. but even but even with that, mm. one one of the big things that I want that I want that I wanted to dive into is the fact that the fact that this is. This is meant to be a fa a fantasy tabletop game that is on the customizable end. Is yes. it a ki is? But the thing is, fantasy. Not to use too much of a fishing reference, but given mm -hmm. where I am, I kind of have to. Yeah. Is a very wide net to cast. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have high fantasy. You've got low fantasy. You have dark, you have high. You've got high fantasy like Lord of the Rings. You've got low fantasy like like say Game of Thrones. You've got yeah. sword and sorcery like your Conans. You have you have science fantasy like like your um, Warhammer 40k. You have you yeah. have you have dark fantasy um, like your like your and geez, way too way too many entries coming out of Eastern Europe uh, that I could mention. Yeah. You ha you have you have more um, wuxia like affairs. You have more mo you have more manga leaning aff affairs. You yeah. Ha you have all these different subgenres within um, fantasy, and that's not even getting into more science fantasy affairs like the yeah. er, like the early pulp era or the good eras of Star Wars, Disney, <laughs> Disney yeah. notwithstanding. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> uh, so when it, and this is a problem that D and D has had, where it ta where it talks about, oh, you can use this to run any fantasy campaign, and in reality. Is designed mm -hmm. very much skews towards um, Western Europe slash British Isles style fantasy. Nothing wrong yeah. with that, but you can't. But um, don't be a Janus. Yeah, for sure. So, with your world, are you designing it ar around 
being subgenre ag agnostic, or do you have a particular style that you're skewing towards? Yeah, that that's a good question. I think the the game in its sort of default state is meant to be more epic high fantasy. Um, I definitely draw a lot of inspiration from anime in terms of not trying to be like like too specific in anime, like I don't know the names of like you know characters or specific moves, but in the way of like let's say One Piece being this sort of epic tale where the characters will say just in the world start at a very low power tier, but by the end, even though it's not done, but in the most recent episodes, they do climb these ranks. They are these epic characters that the world kind of looks at and like they can kind of sway like history and create these, these giant moments. So I really love, oh yeah, go ahead. Would, since you brought up anime, which that, that again is a wide net. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anime is not a genre, it's a medium. Anyone who says it's a genre is wrong. Completely, but yeah. <laughs> it sounds like to me that you are leaning more towards the ballpark of shonen battle manga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely leaning more towards shonen. I take a lot of inspiration from Naruto as well. But um, yeah, it's it, it, I find inspiration everywhere. But I think definitely as a core for what I want this game's experience to feel like, it's definitely along those lines. You know, you definitely not exact, per se zero to hero um but in a sense yeah you, your characters are going to become these giant forces in the world a small team or so that everyone just reveres and respects at least eventually um but also like i don't want them to start incapable so level one you're not just some like geek off the street you're not some random guy no you're you're capable at level one mm -hmm. um I'm trying to think. I'm not sure how familiar you are with things like One Piece or whatnot. Oh, I, oh, I <laughs> am. <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome. Okay, so yeah, I, I, made, I kind of imagine. I made an like. I go ahead. An, not to not to get too far not to get too far into it, but just to illustrate yeah. how familiar I am. Yeah. I was in a contest with, regarding writing a um, regarding writing a devil fruit, and the yeah. one I wrote was the shot shot fruit, which okay. the central idea what was its user can control relative mass of things that it that it touches. Okay. Esen essentially um essentially reduce the mass to like 1% and then it then it goes back to normal when it's um bet when it's out of their hands. They're not touching it anymore. Mm. Yeah. This me this means that they could throw like a like a um they could make a cannonball mm. and and throw throw that thing manually like it's a like it's a base like it's a baseball. And the yeah. thing ends up breaking the sound barrier because of, <laughs> because you're essentially violating the law of conservation of energy. You know, throwing yeah. it at high velocity at a low mass, then it regains its normal mass. So it's but still mm -hmm. has that same velocity, which ends up increasing. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> uh, that's next level. Yeah. <laughs> the idea came because I would I would see, so I would see how fast those uh, how fast pro pitchers can go like mm. we're talking 110 miles an hour and oh, yeah. the infamous um pigeon incident with Randy Johnson where a pit where a bird got right in the middle of his pitch midway through <laughs> yeah oh um, man i can only imagine <laughs> yeah so i'm no stranger i'm no stranger to one piece nice nice yeah so for me i guess level 1 characters would be almost like leaving east blue mm -hmm. basically and then you know i guess Level ten would be like the most recent episodes, which I haven't really seen. I finished Wano. And I like I want the episodes to build up, but um, kind of, I'll say, say Wano. Would you say levels. that level ten would be akin to the four emperors? Yeah, pretty. Yeah, exactly. Like the four emperors, mm -hmm. um, just like the height, the 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 strongest of the strong. These people's names like can protect entire islands. You know, like this is under white beards. You know, surveillance, or whatever. Like that's who you are at level ten. This world knows you, and some parts of it fear you. Other parts love you and respect you. But you are this sort of like huge figure in the world. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that, and I I definitely see some of the some of the five E DNA when it comes to the way the way um the way you have your leveling scheme work. Yeah, though. 
that do, that does bring me to one to one more um qu- one more question. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes, because one of the things I see is the concept of arts and yeah. chambers of power. Yes. Now, from my observation, mm-hmm. it seems that chambers of power is some is somewhat analogous to spells. So I do have, I do have to ask if you are you if you're utilizing the spells per day model or if you have something different in mind. Yeah. So th- yeah, this is a bit different but also a bit similar cuz yes, like in D&D, once you use up your spell slots for most people anyways, you have to take a long re- sorry, a long rest to get them back. Similarly, yes, with these chambers of power, you'll have to take a in my game full rest ultimately the same thing um a full rest to get those back um and so in that way yes they are similar i guess a key difference would be that all characters have these whether you have magic or not as it's more just your chambers of powers are essentially something that everybody in a sense has it's like energy within each and every living creature but like any muscle the more you exercise it the stronger it gets um, hence why you get access to higher level ones as you train mm-hmm. and all that. Um, but yes, you can use these chambers of powers to augment your techniques. So again, kind of going to One Piece, probably going to talk about a lot of One Piece. <laughs> uh, like Luffy, he can just use his Gatlin gun kind of whenever he wants. That's just a technique he has. But there are ways that he can kind of augment that or, you know, Zoro when he swings his swords and uses his like... Uh, I can't think of any of his techniques now for some reason. <laughs> and that's well, probably my favorite character. One is only <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, like that, or, or like the, the uh, Asura um, technique. Um, like these are just techniques he has at his disposal, as well as just kind of typical swordplay. Mm-hmm. Those are his base arts, but then using like hockey, among other things, right, can amplify that. Mm-hmm. So for like a warrior class who has no magic, a lot of their chambers of powers are focused on just amplifying their own like physical attributes um, or like for spellcasters more about affecting the world around you and that's how their powers um, end up uh, manifesting but so yeah like if you throw some sort of fire art mm-hmm. you can do things like increase the range or the radius or how much damage it does um, you can add conditions like it, um, so they're know. not fire and forget exactly Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, another thing was, like, I want all arts to be, or at least hopefully most of them, to be pretty interesting. For example, like, going back to the fire example, you throw a fire um, art and and the uh, opponent may get the burn condition, you know, or, you know, ice art, they may get the frozen condition. Things like that just kind of make sense to me. It's very, like, natural in my mind. I think it just makes everything feel a little bit more interesting. Um, you know, when playing things like D and D, there's like this this sort of conundrum I've seen come up. Not at my own table, but you know, when a player like can't light something on fire with firebolt because something like create bonfire exists, creates like this sort of weird ruling. Like, well, firebolt doesn't say you can do it, and a little weird things like that. Yeah, but <laughs> that's what that's what I refer to as the the um, fire and forget rule. Um, yeah, that's one yeah, of the, that's one of the three unfortunate pillars of that classic spellcasting model, which is known as the Vancean model after um, yep. Jack Vance. Um, yeah. Which is, which is ironic when the, when the RPG that's based on his work, the Dying Earth, the Dying Earth RPG doesn't use that model. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, yeah, there's been stuff like, and even, um, there's, there's been stuff like the Dungeon Crawl Classics adaptation of Dying mm. Earth, but um, that's an adaptation of DCC, not and yeah, <laughs> there was also Lionese, which was using Mithras, which is a fork of RuneQuest, which yep. is using an MP system. So it's <laughs> it's a bit it's something that's kind of it's something that's kind of um, amusing. Yeah. The yeah. The other thing that that I couldn't help but I couldn't help but notice is you, um, unless I'm misreading this, you're you are um you did not do the um. Feet as an feet as an optional thing for for ASI. You have ASI ability score improvement, but yep. it looks it looks like at I think at every level characters are getting a feat. 
Yes, yes. As of right now, characters get a fee at every level. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, very different from uh, D and D. Um, and right now, the intention now fully say nothing's polished. Things are still <laughs> very heavily under construction. It's but still yeah, raw, as exactly Gordon Ramsay would say. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> um. But yeah, the intention is that feats are going to be more of a way to accent or diversify or even like kind of turn things up from like 10 to 11 for your character. Personalized. But they aren't ne- exactly. Um, they're just another way to customize. Most of your characters, like I'll just say power, mm-hmm. is going to come from the class and subclass. And then your you know background, your ancestry of the feats they're going to personalize a lot more. They're still going to add to you, but it's not going to be like quite the same as the sort of general level progression everyone has, like in terms of like proficiency bonus and ASIs, that that's pretty equal across the board, and the class abilities and arts and, and the like, chambers of power. Yeah, feats are going to be a lot more customizable. Which, yeah. in, that, in that regard, it ends mm-hmm. up addressing something that I, even when 5e came out, I was very critical of. And there's mm-hmm. video evidence to demonstrate that, and that is, yeah. I al- I was always of the opinion, and maybe I'm maybe you ended up sharing this that mm-hmm. having feats be an alternative to ASI every four levels was a case of missing the point. Yes, because yeah, when f- now I know some will say that uh, that it's better than the ungodly amounts of feats that were in D and D third edition. To that I say, you can swing the the swing the p- swinging pendulum goes both ways. Yeah, just because you exactly. go too f- you can go too far one way or too far the other way. But the fe- the intent of feats when they were introduced mm. back at, back in third edition, all the way back in two thousand, was yep. to allow for a higher degree of customization and personalization beyond just your choice of race and class, and in some cases, um, spells. Although if I'm being exactly. honest, some, if I'm being honest, there's too many goddamn spells as it was, and too many <laughs> useless spells. Like, do I yep. do I really need 18 different versions of protection from <laughs> as their own <laughs> spell entries? Yeah, yeah, doing but way too much. <laughs> the but the but the point the point is is that by reducing that to just four opportunities across 20 levels, when so many when yeah. so many games don't go into the teens because of um, other reasons. Um, mm-hmm. the 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 amount of customization that can be done ends up being bottlenecked, and I feel like, I feel like yeah. it's for that reason that you have so many classes that have um, feats in all but name. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like exactly. Fi- fighters, fighting styles, the um the 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 way that the way that meta magic ends up working, the yep. the in. I'd say a real big example would be the invocations for war. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like a lot like of those the, the infusions. Would, a of, yeah, a lot of those are just are just fe- are feats, but they can't but they can't call them that. Exactly. And yeah, yeah. With now the other th- the other thing that I could that I did I did um note mm. is the unless uh, unless I'm unless I'm misunderstanding this. Mm. Um, when it comes to when it comes to each class, they have they have they are ha- they have certain arts that they're that they're um proficient in. Would those mm-hmm. would those be a, would the arts be a martial equivalent to say the nine spheres of magic, even if there's not nine per se? In terms of That's being a, a general question. category. Yeah. Um. I'd say not necessarily. <laughs> or at least that wasn't my intention. Um, but I'm also saying that because I'm not... Oh, well, I guess, yeah, no, not necessarily. Um, I guess for me... I don't know. I guess when I was tackling the arts, it was... They actually started out being something only the uh, warrior class could do. Because I did, you know, coming from D&D, was kind of thinking like fancy and style magic... And so I was like, okay, well, like, this martial character needs something that he can do that can kind of rival, you know, spells. Um, but from there, I was like, well, what if, 
like this was just how it worked for everybody um that'd be a pretty good equalizer but my my point is that i try to just think about them thematically for like, what is this class like meant to be and do and kind of create arts like around that so there are definitely like at least classes that i want to make that are stretch goals or will maybe come out in the future that might be more like support based or healing or more uh like illusion or like utility or whatever else uh but yeah i wouldn't say any of them are like a specific like school of magic or circle of magic or or anything like that necessarily more like, like uh probably close to like party roles maybe um yeah <laughs> yeah i guess i guess that's kind of more what i was going for um so like in the case of the um the warrior class really all three in the playtest they're more of the damage dealers of the bunch um so that's why so many of their arts do that but also um for like the uh, druid um not not the druid the hunter class they also can do some uh a little bit of like battlefield control as a part of their uh, utility kit of arts as well um but yeah no it's, it's more like can i thematically create techniques for each class that i think that will deliver on the fantasy of them i guess is my approach i could see that and are you familiar with the term gish yes right. yes yes um something that i've something that i've had to tell people whenever they want whenever they say oh i want i want to do a a manga themed take um, take on fa on fantasy or so or something along that lines is in a lot of in a lot of in a lot of what I'll call Western fantasy mm -hmm. and especially especially ones that are drawing upon the a lot of that war gaming scene out of the seventies. There yeah. is that clear dividing line between the martial characters and the magical characters. I mean, yeah. yes, there's gishes, but that's um. That's a whole. That's a whole bag. That's a whole bag of worms. I don't feel like oh, getting yeah. into, not without <laughs> sure. more alcohol. Um, <laughs> but yeah. when you look at the various characters in a lot of different shonen battle manga, they mm -hmm. would end up qualifying as gishes just oh, yeah. just based on their kit. Um, yeah. Luffy, Luffy def would definitely count under that. You because one could argue hockey is very much a psychic effect. Um, oh, for sure, and that—that's not even getting into the ge the gear shifts, especially yeah. the most recent one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. was done yeah. just because um, Oda wanted to do something like Tom and Jerry. His yeah. words, not mine. <laughs> um, you look at yes. you you look at say Naruto. You definitely have that with pretty much well, every with pretty much everybody yeah. save. I I would <laughs> I know some people would say Lee would be an exception. No. It's yeah. just it's just a di it's just a different coat of paint, especially the lotus. For but sure. You you look at you look at Dragon Ball Z. I don't need to say anything yeah. more than that. More on that yeah, front. Yeah. You you look at even um even something like Hero Aka. Mm. You def you definitely see that. And truth be told, the, the Gish thing could apply just as well to superheroes. But that's another story. Yeah. The point is oh, yeah. is that the the line between a martial focus character and a magic focus character mm. it either does not exist or it only barely exists. Yeah. Um, even characters who their whole character their whole a big part of them is that they can't use magic like say Asta mm. in Black Clover. Yeah. Is still using magic just in a different coat. Yep. Exactly. Um, and the and that's what. That's why I'm glad that you ca that you shifted into that with the with that realization, since it's mm -hmm. it is something I've seen a lot of people str a lot of people struggle with. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to the arts, I I've I see that you have the requirements as well as empowerments. Yeah. So what what exact is empowerment something that you something that you would be spending a resource to utilize to basically beef up um. Um, arts, or is there a different approach? Uh, no, yeah, yeah. So that is what you would uh, use your chambers of powers for. Mm -hmm. um, you would, so let's say that you can add a damage die, and currently I just have the numbers in parentheses, so if there's a one in the parentheses, mm -hmm. you can spend a level one chamber of power to um, you know add that effect onto your art. 
or you know spend two chambers of power to get the uh frozen condition on your art so you have to spend like a second level uh, chamber of power to do that eventually there's more flexibility and like you could take like a bunch of smaller ones to get like a bigger effect um to make like a little bit more easy and fluid to um you know use different um amounts but like before that you have to use like the specific like if there's like a two you have to use a second level chamber of power or higher to get that effect um but yes that's that's what you would use yeah. to um get those effects and i see at higher levels you have the concept of limit breaks now i i know some people would look at that and, th and think and think final <laughs> fantasy but the vibe i'm getting out of this unless I'm, unless i'm mistaken is that limit breaks are more are more akin to the transformations that you see in different um in different shonen manga for sure yeah yeah and, and limit break is specific to the to the warrior class mm -hmm. um and kind of my uh the way that I kind of separate like quote unquote like magic and the martial mm -hmm. although it's all ultimately the same source is that the focus kind of literally focuses on the self whereas mana focuses on what's outside of you so like mm -hmm. you you know, throw a fireball. Since the warrior is all focused, he's quite literally like breaking his own limits, making himself faster, stronger, these sorts of things, resistant to certain damage types. Mm -hmm. Um I just forgot your question. <laughs> but <laughs> the point the point yeah. is, is that it a lot of people because of Final Fantasy would think would see limit break and think that it's some limited use Uber attack. When in For reality sure. it is more of an escalation of what that particular what particular class can already do exactly yeah yeah i definitely try to fashion each class um a lesson that i did learn from D, &D doesn't always do well is that th the abilities don't always like build up the character i try to make sure like all the abilities really kind of stack up or like the subclass builds on what the class already has so limit break is a way to yes continue building on what the warrior class is already good at and excels at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now with within within that, one of the other things I did I did notice is that while you you have a very you have a very similar say skill list, mm -hmm. but your but it, when it comes to saves when it comes to saving throws, instead of having one for each ability. You just ha you just have three sa you just have three saves body spirit and mind. Yeah. Oh, was that a, was that a means of simplifying it so that no so that the there's more opportunities to use each type of saving throw? Yeah, yeah. It, it was the, it was a couple reasons that for sure. Um, I just felt like you know splitting like wisdom and intelligence or strength and dexterity. When I'm thinking about like making a game epic, I think in some ways it's also simplifying it where you can and not getting too bogged down or, you know, in, in that sort of way. So part of it was simplifying it. Um, but also it's like, you know, if I'm particularly wise and I'm particularly intelligent over here and we're both getting attacked in our mind, maybe we we'll, we have our own sort of, you know, defenses within our mind to, you know, resist the same ability, right? Or Oh, somebody's throwing some giant like, boulder at me. Well, I'm strong, so maybe I just, you know, kind of brace for impact. And this person over here is fast, so I move out the way. But ultimately, we're leaning into our strength to like, resist it. So it's kind of like you can kind of tackle the same thing in different ways um, was another, like, idea I want to get across with it as yeah. well. Um, but yeah, yeah, I thought it was just a little simpler that way. Mm -hmm. And... With the, now with that in with that in mind, mm. um, one of the other, one of the other things I couldn't help but notice is the base damage rule that you have that you have it. The way the way that I see it is it seems is it seems like you're trying to standardize the rate of damage to to a certain yeah. extent. Yes. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yep. 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 That's definitely accurate. Um, I I've definitely. As I started designing all of this, mm -hmm. I was like, I want to make sure that just the overall template for each class is designed in a way that it'll help to just like balance everything out kind of naturally. Mm -hmm. um, if the foundations vary even for everybody, I think that makes it to where 
Like, nobody can just, like, run, like, too far ahead of the others. Nobody can fall behind. Obviously, there will always be, you know, different balances uh, with things. But, yeah, that was definitely a big part of it. So everybody will naturally scale up together at the same levels. Um, which, yeah, I just, I just feel like that was, a, at least for now, a good way to, to go about it. Yeah. And, you know, it'll probably be tweaked in the future. But, yeah. One of the other things to to note is that you are utilizing an action point system instead of a t- instead of a um, action categorization affair. Yes. So what what prompted this particular system? And were there any inspirations you were drawing from with it? Yeah, there was two inspirations. Uh, when I d- dove into Pathfinder, when I heard about the action point system, I'm like, oh, that sounds really cool. And then I saw how limited it was. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> but the other inspiration was uh, Divinity Original Sin 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that game. Oh, I am. Uh, I'm very familiar with the Divinity <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I played that game twice. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really liked it. I, re- I really enjoyed it. And, yeah, I just like the, um, the, the freedom to, like, what do I need to do this turn? And knowing that like there's just different ways to spend those points mm-hmm. to um yeah to get you know to get things done. So I definitely like thought about long and hard like how many and you know it could still change. Um, I did some play testing and at first the people play test play testing thought that was like maybe too many mm-hmm. action points, but as we played more, like actually this feels pretty good right now. But you know, we- we'll see. Um, but yeah, so right now. All sort of, I call them important actions, cost at least one action point. I don't really want to worry about like opening a door, or pulling out your sword, or sheathing it. In my mind, that's not epic. So it's kind of presumed, oh, combat's starting. You're mostly ready to fight unless you're surprised. But yeah, moving, using um, arts. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Like analyzing a foe, mm-hmm. things like that will all cost action points. Uh, but what I've find so far is that typically what you want to do in your turn you're able to do um and yeah so far i like it so far i don't think it's perfect i think it needs some tweaking but so far it works pretty well mm-hmm. yeah yeah um ember wind used this used its own action point setup it was significantly s- smaller than what you're going with but yeah the intent the intent is still there so for sure Next, I wanted to ask about the so- the social chart, especially this wheel design that you've got in the material you had you showcased. Yeah, um, yeah. With with how this is set up, is it a, is it a case where potentially someone could use it where a get where a given NPC they're interacting has a certain space on this wheel that is moving about based on the party's actions? Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's ultimately the intent. The backgrounds sort of interact with it. So um, if you're like a soldier, the average commoner will probably have some level of respect for you automatically. Mm-hmm. That's sort of, you know, I'm, I don't want to, you know, piss this soldier off or anything. So, you know, not necessarily fear, but, you know, so they might be moved up towards, you know, one towards respect. And in that way, they may be willing to do certain things. Um, and yeah, it's definitely meant to be a way to quite literally just chart like you know the player's um, experience with the NPC, how this NPC feels about them. Um, as of now, that's probably that's one of the newer concepts. Um, so it's not like super super fleshed out. I like what I got so far. Mm. Has to go through a lot more iterations, but it's definitely meant to be um, a way to showcase like, yep, these this is like what you did. This is like where this NPC is at now with you. It's meant to be more of a like an easy reference tool to use rather than like some like super hard coded uh, thing. Although I know that there are people out there who like more um, concrete rules with things, so I'm not sure if they're in this playtest or if they're just my design notes. But um, there are like more concrete ways to like see how someone moves on the uh, social chart. Like if you like do this many like checks that are success, they'll like move towards like. You know, if you want them to like love you, um, in the sense of just like adore you and willing to do things for you, you have to like maybe get like five checks in a row. I forget what it was, but mm-hmm. it was a little haphazard for now because I'm like, this is a cool concept. Let me throw it out there, see how people feel about it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's definitely um, meant to be a tool for that to like gauge the players' interactions with the NPCs. Mm-hmm. And with that, in, with that in mind, um, yeah, on the 
GM end of end of things, do you plan on do you plan on putting in a system so that um, GMs could create their own adversaries, their own NPCs, and the like? Yeah, yeah. So that's definitely a goal of mine. Um, I made like a little video for people if you want like you know play test it. Like, hey, here's kind of what I'm doing in some of my play tests. How I'm kind of making monsters as of now. Obviously, I would love to make a full you know monster manual one day in the future. I'll do that for sure. Um, but yeah, all things in time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah, definitely. There's gonna be a section of like, hey, uh, kind of like a quick start guide. Uh, here's like you know some things you can follow to make creatures for your players to fight against. Uh, and ultimately, I think maybe not in the next play test, but the one after that, I'll debut that. Um, but yeah, yeah, I want I want to make sure that people have everything they need to start playing, mm -hmm. and then as time goes on, hopefully just you know, just um, expand, you know, with more character options, more things for DMs. Um, but it is kind of like a player's handbook and a DM guide kind of smashed into one, which is basically D&D's 5e uh, player handbook <laughs> uh, approach. But yeah, yeah, I'm definitely going to um, have that in there. Yeah. I can, I can certainly see that. I can certainly see that. And yeah. with the... Now, with that in mind, um, for the core book, what would you be shooting for as far as the page, as far as the page count is concerned? Yeah. So, as of now, because like no stretch goals are um, unlocked, the the number I had in my head, which I know I'm not gonna hit, so let me just adjust it on the fly. No, um, I, I was thinking around like 120 pages. Mm -hmm. um, between the character options, because um, really the character options are what take up most of the document for the most part. The, in a sense, actual rules, um, if you were, take up a pretty small portion, like on the back end, uh, like this is how you adjudicate roles and, and the like. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to find ways to make sure everything's like efficient, um, like by having a, uh, like a terms section, so you can just kind of quick reference things as well. Try to make it efficient, uh, try to make the game easy, you know, quote unquote, easy to learn. You know, most tabletop games aren't necessarily easy. Uh, they all are going to take some level of, of work. But, um, you know, trying to make it a little bit more approachable than I'll say like D&D. And I know I kind of been like talking bad about D&D. I love D&D, but, uh, well, but yeah, nothing's hurt, perfect. You hurt the ones you love, so. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> But um yeah, about 120 pages. If I could get it even you know less than that, I definitely would. But not to cut anything out, but just to be efficient. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's generally the the goal that I'm aiming for. Mm -hmm. I could I could certainly see that, and I do want to give yeah. my congrats for the for the fact that you've managed to go past your goal goal <laughs> um, at this stage. Yeah. Where, at the time we're recording this, it's at 14:47. Um, I can yeah. I kind of wish it was eleven dollars shorter at the time we recorded this so I could make a bad joke, but that's another <laughs> story. Um, For sure. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. And I do. And again, I do want to give my thanks for you for you to come to coming all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness <laughs> that happens around here. No problem. It was a long journey, you know. I saw a hydra along the way and a couple other things, but it was worth it. Once I got to the temple, I was like, yeah, this place is pretty nice. This yeah. this is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no, but thank thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's just cool to have people like reach out and you know support. It's you know when you're that creative person and you're just you know, you're not really sharing your stuff with the world, and then you're like, you know what? Let me do it. Let me just put it out and see what happens. And then people like you reach out. It, it means so much. And uh, yeah, I'm just glad that we got to do this. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further discuss your world or to, to um, or to rest to restart Waifu War Three, <laughs> or, or um, to, or to just general, just general shit posting, the door is always open. As I often say awesome. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Amazing. And I of course. It. A sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty yeah. more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. <laughs> but until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, 
I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Awesome.